Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so our first speaker for this session is going to be John van der Wittling talking about simulating quantum circuits with the next calculus reduced stabilizer decompositions. Take it away. Thank you, Miriam. Yeah, so I'll be talking about uh, classical circuit simulation. Uh, so the problem is we want to somewhat efficiently simulate quantum circuits. Of course, in the general setting, we don't expect it to be faster than exponential because, well, if you could do it efficiently, we would all be out of a job, right? But it's like we can still think of how what's like the smartest way we can do it. And I'd say there's broadly there's broadly two different categories of classical circuit simulation. There are the tensor network based methods. I'm not going to say anything about these, but like generally these scale exponentially in a number of qubits, right? And there are stabilized decomposition based methods. And broadly, these scale exponentially not the number of qubits, but in the number of non Clifford gates. Um, and in this talk, I'll be talking about stabilizer rank. There's also this technique of stabilized extent, but that won't be relevant for this talk. So I'll be talking about the stabilizer rank technique. So, what is that? Well, I think most of you are familiar with the Goldsmith Knill theorem, which says that if you have a constant computation, which consists of uh, a stabilized state preparation and then Clifford unitaries and the stabilizer measurement, you can efficiently classically simulate this, right? Um, and then there's an interesting observation that the stabilizer states actually span the entire set of quantum states. So if I have an arbitrary state uh, cat psi, I can write this as a linear combination of stabilizer states. Um, and this has like a number of terms and the minimal number of terms that I need to write a state, I call the stabilizer rank of this thing, which I write with a, with a chi here, okay? Now, why is this interesting observation? It's because it leads to a strategy for uh, circuit simulation. So for instance, suppose we start with a Clifford plus T circuit. So this is an approximately universal gate set, so we can write approximately any computation in this way. And then we write each T gate as a magic state injection, so the standard gadget. Um, which means that our circuit now is a Clifford circuit, but at the beginning we have some ancillas which are prepared in a T uh, magic state. Uh, we can then decompose these T magic states as a sum of stabilizer states, which means now our entire computation is a sum of Clifford computations. Uh, we can efficiently simulate each of these and then just add the results together, model out some details, of course, and then we are done. Okay, so we can simulate quantum computations using this way. So, what's the catch? Well, the stabilizer rank. So the minimal number of terms you need to write um, these magic states in terms of stabilized states. If I have k magic states, this scales exponentially with k. So I might need to sum exponentially many terms. But the crucial bit here is that it's not just two to the k terms. We can actually do better than this. So it's still exponential, but better exponential. <coughs> so how does this work? Well, if I have a single t magic state, so this is um, like zero plus one with some phase. So I can see this is already this is a sum of two stabilized states. Right? This is a sum of zero and it's a sum of one. So the stabilizer rank of this thing is exactly two. And that means I can just repeat this for every magic state and then I get two to the k terms. So we know that the stabilizer rank of k magic states is at most two to the k. But we can do better because if we have two magic states, well, I can just expand this in like in the computational basis and I can group these terms more efficiently. So I have this zero, zero plus I one, one state and I have this zero, one plus one, zero state. And you recognize these as bell states, and these bell states are Clifford. So actually, the stabilizer rank of two magic states is still two. So that means if I pairwise decompose these magic states, um, I only need two to the k over two. So this comes down to two to the 0 0.5 k. Okay, so we've decreased our exponential scaling. So it's still exponential, but better. Turns out, if you have six magic states, there's a decomposition into seven terms. This is at all not obvious, by the way. Um, and that means that we can actually scale it with two to the alpha k, where alpha is this 0 0.467. This was found by Bravery, Smith, and Smolin. So I'm gonna call this a BSS decomposition. Uh, for those familiar with magic state decompositions, yes, I'm aware there are better ones. We'll get to that, we'll get to that later. But uh, yeah, so there's this 67 decomposition and this gives you quite good scale. Okay, so our idea, what we did in the paper, is do this strategy, this simulation strategy, it uses ZX diagrams instead of circuits. And the benefit of that is that we can optimize intermediate diagrams and this reduces T count, which means we need to do less decompositions. I'm gonna explain what ZX diagrams are, but I'd like to see a show of hands who here has like heard of ZX calculus or ZX diagrams. Oh wow, that would not have been true two years ago. Okay, that's great. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll give like a brief introduction to that anyway, but uh, yeah. 
Okay, so uh, this is described in two papers of ours. I'm mostly going to be talking about the first paper. Uh, the second paper gives some ways to improve this, and we'll hopefully have time to get to that. But let me just first describe what we do in the first paper. So the algorithm we propose is, first step is you write a Clifford plus P circuit as a ZX diagram. Then you simplify a diagram with your favorite algorithm. It's like whatever diagram you want. The goal is to decrease the T count. Uh, then you pick some spiders with a T-like phase, so they're sort of magic state-like. And you decompose these into stabilized states. Um, then you have a sum of diagrams, and you simplify each of the diagrams again, and hopefully uh, kill some uh, non clifford phases. And then you repeat this. So then each of these diagrams, you again pick a couple of spiders to decompose. You get more diagrams. You simplify each of them, etc. And you do this until you've reached your uh, desired simplicity. So your diagrams are simple enough. You can exactly calculate the scalar value of it. And then you add together all diagrams. And uh, then hopefully uh, you get something that scales better than the other methods we've seen before. Okay, so I'm gonna explain each of these steps in detail. So first, uh, ZX diagrams. So um, to a first approximation, it is just a alternative notation for circuits, uh, for circuit notation, right? So um, you see above, we have a couple of gates, which I wrote now in ZX notation. So you see the, the Z phase gates, the S, the T, T dagger. They correspond to these green dots, which I'll call Z spiders. And there's like a phase in there. So the S gate is a pi over two rotation of block sphere. So you write a pi over two in there. T gate is a pi over four rotation. So you write pi over four. Uh, the X gate is an X rotation. So we use a different color. We use a red color. And then the C naught gate is now this, these two <laughs> things attached together, which will become clear later why we do that. And the Hadamard, we have this special like yellow box, which is just like a sort of syntactic sugar because it'll be useful. And then uh, to change a uh, circuit into the next diagram, we just do this gatewise and we attach them together in a similar way. So, so far it's just alternative notation, um, but it will actually be useful, I promise. So um, how do we actually, what actually is a ZX diagram? Well, what gates are to circuits, spiders are to ZX diagrams. And spiders come in two flavors. We have Z spiders and X spiders, which are depicted with green or red. And why did the screen just go blank? <laughs> okay. So um, these things can have any number of inputs, any number of outputs, and they're just linear maps. Um, you can think of a Z spider as sort of a generalized chronic delta, where now you're sort of forcing, forcing all your inputs and outputs to be the same state. And if they're in the one state, you give them a phase alpha. And the X bar is exactly the same, but in the X basis instead of the Z basis, right? So for example, if I have a single input, single output, then these are just your Z phase gates and X phase gates, where um, the alpha is the angle of rotation on your gate. So you can just calculate these as matrices, okay? Um, if your phase alpha is zero, we're just not gonna write a zero, just write it without, you like less, less cluttering. Um, and then we have some examples. For instance, if I have a uh, X spider with no inputs and one output, uh, this is, well, this is the plus state plus the minus state. This is up to a scalar, it's just equal to cat zero. If I put a pi in there, we get the cat one. And the green spiders, we get a plus state and minus state. So we can represent these sort of canonical standard basis states uh, using spiders. Um, so we can compose these spiders in two ways. We can either do a horizontal composition, so put them, stack them on top of each other. This gives, this gives the tensor product of linear maps. Uh, so here's an example. Here's another example, take a tensor product with, uh, with uh, the X spider. Um, and that's one form of composition. The other is, um, is um, composing them like in sequence. And this is just regular composition of linear maps. So here you have, um, so you have a Z spider with an identity and an identity and an X spider. And I compose these and I see I get this matrix. And this matrix is actually uh, a C naught up to a scalar. And these scalar factors usually don't matter. So we see you can compose these things and get other like maps out of it. Uh, and any ZX diagram can be built by simply iterating these vertical and horizontal compositions. Uh, there's an important note here, which is that if you were to calculate the matrix on the left-hand side here, where you do first the Z and then the X, or you do first the X and then the Z, it turns out you get the same matrix. Uh, so we are allowed to write like a wire sort of uh, vertically because the, whether it goes like forwards or backwards doesn't matter for the linear map. In fact, only connectivity matters. So you can arbitrarily deform these diagrams and they will represent the same linear map. And this means we can treat them as undirected graphs, which is very convenient for software because you can just implement them as a simple graph. 
Uh, okay, so summary, we have two types of generators, Z spiders and X spiders. You can compose them horizontally and vertically, and the wires we can connect everywhere we, everywhere we want. And we only care about which things are connected, not how they are ordered in the space. Uh, and it turns out ZX arguments are universal. So they can represent any linear map between qubits. So not just unitary maps, but any linear map can be represented as a ZX diagram. Okay, so there's a more powerful general notation than quantum circuits. Okay, so, um, so let's get to the first step, like writing our Clifford plus T diagram as a ZX diagram, right? So we've seen the C naught, S gate, T gate. Um, the Hadamard here I still write as a yellow box. Um, you can take a, a Euler decomposition of the Hadamard. So you can write the Hadamard as like a, a Z rotation, X rotation, Z rotation. And these are all spiders. So you can decompose into spiders. It will just be more convenient to have a special notation for it. Uh, we have a cat's X. So now um, X is sort of zero or one. And this gives you either a zero phase or a pi phase. So I can have this sort of unified notation there. Um, and we'll be doing simulation. So I care about calculating amplitudes in my case. So for instance, if you want to calculate the amplitudes of uh, observing a computational Z basis measurement X on U applied to the zero input state, I can represent as this ZX diagram where U is now decomposed into a SSLX diagram. And this represents this amplitude, right? So I can represent this amplitude as a ZX diagram that has no inputs and no, no outputs, because we're really calculating a number. Uh, same goes for marginal probabilities using something we call a doubling technique. So um, now we're taking the marginal, uh, we're just, uh, we're marginalizing out the last wire. So we only care about the first few inputs. Uh, this requires doubling our diagram, which is actually quite problematic because if you have like K T gates in U, then this diagram will have two K T gates, right? Because you have U and U <laughs> Decker, they each contain T gates. It's actually quite problematic, but it will turn out to be fine. Um, so this is a way to represent the marginal probability as, as a select diagram. Um, so a uh, small note, uh, the sort of two notions of simulation, we have weak simulation and strong simulation. So weak simulation means I give you a quantum circuit and I want to get samples out of it, uh, which is BQP complete. So this is actually the power of quantum computer. And we have strong simulation, which is I give you a quantum circuit and an input state and an effect. And I ask, uh, give me the, the actual probability. Like I want to get a number out, not a sample. Uh, well, the name, as the names already imply, strong simulation is harder than weak simulation, and you can uh, use strong simulation to do weak simulation. In this paper, we're doing exact strong simulation, so we're exactly calculating these probabilities. Uh, so we're doing sort of the hard problem. Um, okay, so that's the first part. That's writing your circuit or really your amplitudes as a ZX diagram. So now let's get to optimizing ZX diagrams. And this is where like the real usefulness of the ZX diagrams comes in. This is something we call the ZX calculus. Um, so this is a set of rewrite rules for ZX diagrams. So these are rewrite rules that preserve the semantics as linear maps. So you can do these transformations and the diagram will still implement the same linear map. For instance, uh, the top left one says that if I have two spiders of the same color that are linked together, I can fuse these, these spiders together and then add the phases. While, for instance, the one on the top right, it says that I can push a Hadamard gate through a spider, and well, a Hadamard uh, exchanges the Z and X uh, bases, so it changes the Z spider to an X spider, so it acts as a color changer. So a lot of these rules have these sort of uh, topologically or graph-like nice interpretations that makes it intuitive to work with. Um, I'm not gonna say much more about this, but um, the thing is, uh, these rules are sort of very basic, and they don't really have any directionality to them. You can do them either way. And if you want to do automated optimization on a quant on the computer, you want to have a directed set of rewrites, right? Because you want to, yeah, you want to have some terminating set of rewrites. So you can use these things to develop more complicated rewrite rules that have this terminating quality to them. In general, you can pick rewrite rules that um, always remove a spider from your diagram, so you know they will terminate because at some point there's no more spiders to remove. Uh, I'm not going to give you the details of that. Uh, it's like from my previous papers of our. A virus, really, the details don't really matter. It's important that you have some rewrite strategy that removes um, non Clifford phases from your diagram. That's like the important part. Um, so, if you apply uh, this rewrite strategy, you get a diagram that looks like something like this. The reason this looks complicated is because this is an actual example of a circuit you might want to simulate. This represents the amplitude of some circuit. Uh, we have this notation with a blue dotted line. This is just a shorthand for like a Hadamard existing on 
this diagram. So really, this is just a bunch of Z-spiders connected via Hadamard. Um, and there's two important properties of this diagram that we care about. Namely, the important part is that when we get to this reduced form of a diagram, every spider carries a either a non-Clifford face, so it's, a, it's representing a T-like thing, like a magic state-like thing, or it's part of a, what we call a face gadget, which is a pair of spiders where we have a non-Clifford face, which is just as one leg, and it's connected to a thing which does not have a face. Right, so if we go back to the previous thing, uh, we see on the top, we have all these face gadgets, right? We have all these faces connected to a spider, which does not have a face. And we have these sort of internal nodes, which all carry a face, okay? Now, why is this relevant? Well, it means that if our original, if our original circuit had k t gates, the resulting diagram has at most two k spiders. And this is independent of the number of qubits or the number of gates we started with. So we could have a circuit on thousands of qubits with millions of Clifford gates, uh, but if we only had 10 T gates and the resulting diagram will only have at most 20 spiders. Okay, so this is the size of the diagram are independent of qubits or number of gates, which is really useful. Okay, so these are the first two parts. You can write a circuit as a next diagram, you can optimize the next diagram. Now let's get to the final part where we decompose the magic states and we get to the heart of like our approach. So um, I said that we have that there is this strategy by Bradley Smith Smolin of decomposing six magic states into seven Clifford terms. And if you translate their thing to select calculus, you get this thing. So on the left, we have six five or four spiders. So these are like magic states. And on the right, you can check that each of these uh, terms is Clifford, like it only has pi or two or pi or zero phase. Uh, so this is your decomposition. And the way we use this is if we have some diagram on top, I just pick essentially at random uh, six spiders, which have a alt multiple of pi over four phase. And I unfuse a pi over four so that I see these magic states around here on the bottom. We see we now have six magic states. And then I can decompose these using the thing previously, which means that these six uh, non-Clifford things are replaced by Clifford things, which means that we now get a sum of seven diagrams, but each of these diagrams has less non-Clifford things. And our rewrite strategy, a simplification strategy, removes Clifford things. So now we can make these diagrams smaller again. So yeah, after the first decomposition, we have seven diagrams. We again simplify each of these diagrams, which removes more spiders. And then we again pick six spiders to decompose. And then we get seven times seven diagrams. Um, and we just repeat this procedure until the Rn6 magic states are decomposed, which means our diagrams will be small enough. We can actually calculate the value of them directly, or we can use a small decomposition, which is what we do in practice. And we just sum the values together, and we get the amplitude of the probability that we were calculating. Okay? So how, how well does this work? Well, there is like a worst case. And the worst case is that uh, our simplification strategy never finds a way to remove additional T-like phases. So it removes the spiders, but it never finds a way to combine these non different phases into a different phase. Uh, but this, gives us, this still gives us a benefit. Because in this setting, every diagram only needs a constant number of rewrites. And the size of the diagram is order k, where k is your starting number of t gates. So a rewrite costs at most order k squared, which you're doing this graph rewriting stuff. Uh, there are two to the alpha k diagrams in the end, where alpha is this exponential constant. Uh, so the total cost is 2 to the alpha k times k squared, which looks quite bad, but actually the original algorithm for doing stabilized decompositions has 2 to the alpha k times k to the third, okay? So we get this polynomial benefit here. And this benefit comes from preventing double work, because since we are decomposing one step and then simplifying a bit, we are sort of partially evaluating the stabilizer diagrams, while in the original approach, you decompose everything all at once and then evaluate the stabilizers. So there you're doing a lot of double work because you have lots of similar diagrams and we're sort of preventing this double work. So there's already an asymptotic benefit here. Um, yeah, so this only works for single amplitudes. As I mentioned with this doubling construction, you double the number of T gates, which means that here you get this like factor two in your exponent, which is really terrible. But it turns out in practice that actually, um, since we have these marginals, lots of things are sort of connected to each other and they cancel anyway. So it's not as bad as it might look in practice. Um, but yeah, the asymptotic analysis doesn't work anymore. Okay, so benchmarks. Uh, we benchmarked our approach on 
two families of circuits. Um, first, random Clifford Bastille circuit built out of Pauli exponentials, so sort of um, um, uh, these like um, Ising type terms uh, on 50 and 100 qubits. And we tested on 50 qubit hidden shift circuits, which are a more structured type of circuits that were also used in previous uh, papers on stabilized decompositions. And these are a type of CCZ circuits. Um, and with the CCZ, we decompose these into 70 gates, um, and then we come to Clifford Bastille circuits. Um, and we are, in fact, doing weak simulation of these. So we are sampling from the output distribution. We're just using strong simulation to do that. OK? Uh, so first, Clifford Bastille, so the random Clifford Bastille circuits. So what we tested was how many stabilizer terms do we need to simulate our, our thing, right? So I'm not, uh, I'm not yet caring about the time cost, just how many terms do we need? And so on the left, we are comparing our approach if you don't do any optimization. So if we just decompose all of our thematic states immediately, how many terms do we need versus uh, our approach where you do this iterated optimization and decomposition? And this is a, a log plot on the left. So you see, for instance, if we are uh, working with 50 T gates, then we get a, like a, sometimes we get like a 10 to the 12 term reduction. So like we get like a way less terms. But on the right, we do a different thing. So, because you might argue it's an unfair comparison. So we're doing optimization, right? So really you should be thinking about, I take my circuit and I first optimize for T count, and then I do my, uh, my state by decomposition. So on the right, we do uh, one round of our optimization strategy. This is sort of like a really powerful circuit optimizer because we have an input state and an input effect. So we are, we are taking it into account that we can kill more T gates because we, have, we know which state we are inputting, we know which effect we are calculating. Uh, and there we see we get, uh, that's not a log plot anymore, it's a linear plot. So we still see that we get um, like a factor 10 or factor 20 reduction in terms. It works, it still works, but it works less well, right? But this changes when we go to hidden shift circuits, which are a bit more structured than random circuits. Uh, and now both of these are log plots. And you see that the T count goes up to 1400 there. So these are 50 qubit circuits with 1400 terms. And we actually managed to simulate these using stabilized decomposition, while the previous best approach could do, I think, 40 qubit circuits with at most 60 T gates. Um, and we see that even after comparing to just a single round optimization, we still have a factor of 10 to the like four, 10 to the six reduction in term count. Um, so this turns out to work like really quite well. Um, so the conclusions from this is that, um, well, optimizing your T count before using state by T compositions is really important. We should see this difference in not doing at all any optimization, doing a single round optimization is massive. Um, and the second conclusion is that the efficacy of this method depends very much on the type of circuit you're considering. So we, we really want to look at other types of circuit as well to see how much it generalizes. Um, and the meta level conclusion is sort of that you can't really view optimization and, and simulation as separate. Because in a sense, simulating a quantum circuit is sort of fully optimizing your quantum circuit, right? You're optimizing it down to a single number. So in this sense, it's just two sides of the same coin. Okay, so this is the first paper, and I see I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to quickly talk about the second paper. Uh, so this was based on, we want to improve these decompositions, um, these stabilized decompositions. Um, and this was uh, based on this paper that came out roughly around the time our first paper came out, uh, which by Kasim, Pashayan, and Gosset. So they found better decompositions. And the gist of that is that this was based on the thing they called cat states, and they turn out to have a very canonical representation as SLX diagrams. And we can use this to give these very nice decompositions. Um, and it turns out that these cat states, we can find a lot of them in our diagrams because they're actually phase gadgets in disguise. So whenever we have a phase gadget, we can use their decomposition. And their decomposition is much more efficient than um, the, just the standard metric state decomposition. So as long as our phase gadgets, we can do better decompositions. But it turns out that even if there aren't phase gadgets, we can use this thing that we call a partial stabilized decomposition. So on the left, we have five magic states. And on the right, we have three terms, which now each have only one pi over four phase. So they're not fully stabilizer. They just have less stabilized terms, right? So we are trading five magic states for a single magic state in three terms. So this effectively gives you a way to um, exchange four magic states for three terms, which is a really good decomposition, like 
much better than the ones you're previously using. Uh, yeah, this means that we are like that means like not all decompositions are created equally. Like we're looking for uh, certain things first and then other things. So we uh, improved our algorithm with this thing and we benchmarked it. And we saw that, for instance, just working on 20 qubit circuits, um, comparing to uh, the approach I just talked about, even like with TCAN 43, we already see a order of magnitude improvement in runtime. Uh, this is running on a, a laptop, by the way. So we're doing 20 qubit simulation, TCAN 43, and we can do it in a couple of seconds. Um, this is benchmarks for the 50 qubit hidden shift circuits. Um, and again, I want to point out that these are all T count 1400 circuits and we're simulating them in at most six minutes on a laptop. So these are like really big circuits and it, it works surprisingly well for these things. Um, yeah, so and most of them finish within five minutes. So I think that's really nice. Uh, yeah, so conclusion, uh, using ZX, we can greatly speed up stabilized range simulations, especially if your circuits are structured. Uh, and it additionally allowed us to find better decompositions by using the structure of the diagram. We can find these decompositions um, that you couldn't find if you just look at the circuit because these cat states aren't really circuit-like. They don't appear in your circuit, but they do appear in your, in your select items at simplification. Uh, future work is to use more diagram optimizations. The strategy we use for simplification is really a circuit strategy. And there's many things we can do for non-unitary optimizations. Um, I said we essentially pick our spiders at random, like maybe we can find good heuristics for which spiders we should pick. That should we pick highly connected spiders, loaded connected spiders, spread out to the diagram, or focus on a small part of the diagram, there's many things there. Uh, we did ex exact strong simulation. Is there a way we can do approximate simulation? Is there a way we can do weak simulation? We don't know yet. Uh, can we use stabilized extent methods instead of stabilized rank methods? We also don't know that. So there's a bunch of things you want to try. Um, uh, yeah, there's, these are, here's a bunch of papers that uh, you might want to check out if this you find it interesting. The top two are our papers, and these bottom two papers are things that like inspired us to do this work. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? How naturally does this generalize to if I don't want to put there plus T, but put there plus some other things? Okay, let me just repeat the question first, maybe so everyone can hear it. So um, it was about how naturally this generalizes to other phases. So rather than Clifford plus T having some other kind of phase gates in the circuit. Mm -hmm. So um, you can do it, but it will work less nicely. So let me get to the way back in the beginning. <sighs> yeah, so here's the top one, right? This decomposition with the T gate into two terms. This works for like any magic state. So any phase, you can do this. So you can always take any non clifford phase and decompose into two terms. So this naive thing, you can also do on the select diagrams. The reason you expect less benefit from the ZX approach, the nice thing about the optimization is if you have two T-like phases and they combine, they instantly become Clifford. But if you have some arbitrary alpha, they just become two alpha and it's still non-Clifford. So yes, you can reduce your two things to one thing, but it's less nice. So you can do it. I expect it to be work way less nice. Another quick question, maybe? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you come, okay, um, in comparison with this other word by Hartford, I'm uh, kind of like uh, all the reasons. Because hmm. around the year ago, they also had a nice. You mean the paper published in quantum, like sort of the long paper with all the different results and stuff? I think it's, I, I guess it was QIP this year. I think some published. Like they, they had some group or uh, I guess they stopped. Um, so I, I just wonder, can you just like combine both approaches? Like, uh, I don't know this approach, so I don't know. Okay. And that's the second. Okay, I'm mean, just, just a commentary. This is by Rabi Gosset from that December last year that actually uh, yeah, the marginals without, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a master student that's starting, uh, I think, in two weeks that's going to implement that for us in our methods. Yeah, yeah, I was really excited about seeing that. So, yeah. Okay, uh, another very quick question? Or... Yep. Oh, I was Sorry? Yeah, so we implemented this into an open source software called Quizix, which is a Rust port of physics. 
Um, and yeah, you can in principle run it. Um, I don't know how user friendly it is. Uh, don't, I think the, the documentation might be a bit lacking, but if you know Rust, you should be able to figure it out. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we should probably wrap up at this point so we can move on to the next talk and not be too late for lunch. Uh, th let's thank the speaker again.